we're together, and I trust you came to meet with the Lord. I would like us to stand. We're going to read a scripture together to start our service this morning, and this is a scripture from Psalm chapter 5. It's on the screen, so why don't we read this aloud together as we open our service. Verse 11 says, But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy. And spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. Those who take refuge in the Lord should be able to rejoice. I trust that that's your testimony this morning, that you do take refuge in the Lord, and that you are here with a heart of joy this morning, that you're rejoicing. Even if things aren't going as well as you'd like, our refuge is in the Lord, and he is our reason for joy this morning. We're going to sing Joy Unspeakable, so why don't you sing this with me, and uh, let's rejoice in the Lord this morning. to greet somebody beside you this morning. After you've greeted a few folk, you may be seated. All right, we have a few announcements to make this morning. And uh, so we'll proceed with those. I just want to remind all our ladies that Ladies Morning Out Bible Study is Tuesday morning. At 9.45, 
Uh, also, Life Group is Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. at Fred and Abby's. They're studying Ephesians. And Wednesday night, we're having a great time in our Bible study here at 7 p.m., 7 to 8.30. We have our Bible study here. We're studying Revelation. The kids are upstairs, and the youth are also studying their Bible study. Thursday night is choir, and I hope you're all looking forward to our Easter musical this year. It's going to be a great time. Their theme of their musical is, Is He Worthy? And I would say to you this morning, Jesus is worthy. So you'll want to make sure you're prepared for that, and we will also be having a Good Friday service. So put that on your calendar as well. And then this Friday, the youth are going sledding with team time. They're meeting here at 7 p.m. And the Sunday that we all wait for, next Sunday is our potluck lunch Sunday. So I know we look forward to that, don't we? Isn't that a great time of fellowship? And we have been having some awesome food too. I love these different international dishes as well. So what a blessing if you're able to come and join us. It's a great time, a time of good food and great fellowship as well. At this time, we're going to call our ushers forward for our tithes and offerings. And it is such a blessing to be honored and, and have the gifts that we have by Jesus Christ. And we want to give back to him from what he's given to us. And from the youngest to the oldest, we can honor God by giving to him uh, of our tithes and offerings this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Lincoln, would you pray a blessing on the offering? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you as you give. Hunter is coming to lead worship after. tell you I am happy today. So let, your hair looks good. It's good to dye it. <laughs> looks good. Yes. I you tell, oh man, I'm happy. Um, we're gonna we're gonna sing Shine Jesus Shine. So yeah, stand on up with me and let's <laughs> oh let's just sing. <laughs>
but the, the spirit of joy is in this place. Mm -hmm. And he's calling us, for those who are weary and tired, those who have had a hard week and even maybe hard weeks, bring it to the Lord, lay it at the feet of Jesus. Because he says, I want to exchange that. I want to exchange your heaviness and for a spirit of lightness and joy. And it's not that you're not going to experience difficult times in the future or tomorrow even, but he wants to refresh you. So lay down your burdens at the foot of the cross. Let him take it and re be reminded that we're not to carry it alone, that he, we are yoked with Jesus Christ. He carries our burdens. He carries us and his grace is enough. So receive the joy of the Lord this morning. That is a perfect segue <laughs> to uh, this. So I'm going I'm to call up the prayer team and uh, as they come up, I just want to read this scripture and say a quick word on it. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Right? That's worship. And then I sought the Lord and he answered me. I sought the Lord and he answered me. You know, like, like, like Pastor Jonathan said, we, we might not be feeling the joy of the Lord. Go to him. But Hunter, I'm, 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 I'm going through a season of depression. I'm sorry, brother. Come get some prayer. And may the Lord be magnified in your life. Hunter, I'm, but I'm going through a series of loss. Well, I'm sorry, sister. I am. Come get some prayer. Seek the Lord. And may his joy, may his blessings be magnified in your life. And so with that, we are going to sing. Praise be
good, isn't he? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are such a good God, and you sent Jesus that we would know how great your love is. You raised him from the dead that we would know the power that's at work in him and also in us, which is far greater than anything we can even ask for or even think. That's the power that's at work in your people in the name of Jesus. And so, God, we bring before you people who are hurting. We have in our minds people are going through difficult times. I think of May Clark. I think of Ray and Jim and Dolly and different people, Lord, who need a touch from you. We thank you that, Jesus, you're the same one who touched people and brought healing when you were on earth. And now you're even doing greater things through us because you've gone to the Father. So we have great confidence as we come before you that you you hear us, that you answer, and that, Lord, you're at work among your people. And God, you care about us and you care about the whole world. And so, God, I thank you that you've poured your love into our hearts, that, Lord, we just don't care about ourselves, we care about others. We care about those who are outside of these walls. And so, God, I pray that your love even would find its fulfillment, that it would reach out to those who are outside, reach out through us, through our hands, through our feet, through our mouth, that we would declare the goodness, the greatness of our God, that he's Savior, he's healer, he's deliverer, and he saves the best for last. He has so much to bless, so much to work in our lives if we will but turn to him in faith. And so, God, I thank you that you're here and that you want to speak to us. And then, Lord, we're going to leave here better than when we came because, Lord, you spoke to our hearts. Help us to have the, that good heart that will receive your word. Uh, and, Lord, that will be changed by the power of the Spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It's my privilege to... Uh, Ha invites Pastor Feller to come up and share the word with us. I know he has a powerful word. He's speaking through Jeremiah, um, and uh, it's going to be it's going to be good. The necessity stealing a little bit of of his thunder, but it says on the screen already. It says on the board outside the necessity of holiness. And I tell you that. Ha God is the same God he always has been. He was holy in the Old Testament. He was the holy one who dwelt in and among his people in the tabernacle and the temple. And he's the same holy God today. And even as he demanded holiness of his people then, he demands holiness of, of us today. But what he, he requires, he also gives. He brings to us. And so I'm going to invite him. I'm, I feel like preaching, but I'm going to uh, have pastor. It's his turn. Bless you. God bless you. Praise the Lord, John. God bless you. Hallelujah. Isn't the Lord good? Amen. Amen. It's nice to be in the house of the Lord and enjoy his presence and his blessings. And uh, I just thank the Lord for our district superintendent, Gary Tatinger, and his dear wife with us. God bless you folks. It's nice to have you. And uh, we're studying Jeremiah. All my uh, next sermons for this year will be in Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is quite an interesting book. Uh, to preach from Jeremiah, a lot of times you're going to hear negative stuff. And uh, this message today has a negative slant, but also positive. So uh, I pray that uh, you open your hearts to what the Lord has to say uh, Jeremiah chapter 9 is where I'm going. I'm not doing chapter by chapter because we'd be here till the Lord comes. Uh, so we'll uh, turn to chapter 9. Chapter 9 is where I want to turn to for our uh, message. And Jeremiah's metaphors show the depth of his grief. And it's probably where Jeremiah gets the name Weeping Prophet. As you read, uh, I have homework for you today because uh, we're not going to read the whole chapter of Jeremiah. I'm just uh, spotlighting a few sections in chapter 9. So you go home and uh, have a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, and read Jeremiah chapter 9. Good homework assignment. So uh, Jeremiah's metaphors show the depth of his grief, 
grief. And it's probably where Jeremiah gets the name weeping prophet. And in this chapter, we see the heart and the lament of the man of God who wrote Lamentations. Two strong emotions grip Jeremiah, and we see that in the book over and over. One is the great sympathy for his people, and the second emotion is the utter revulsion against their many sins. Jeremiah loved God, and he loved to be holy and walk in holiness and to see the people of God walking in sin grieved his heart, as it would grieve any pastor's heart to see people who claim to know God walk in sin. What a travesty. What a terrible thing to have people of God disobey God. And these people in this book is unbelieving what they did. So he's preaching a message of repentance to the faithless people of God, but they don't want to repent. This is a message of warning to the people of God who are living not as they should. Back in that time, and also in this time, this truth is eternal, this truth is universal. So it applies to us as well as it does to those in Jeremiah's time. And uh, I pray that it produces holiness, that it produces a sound biblical lifestyle in the believers. You know the word of God. If you've been in this church, we emphasize, read the Bible through in a year. Spend time in the Word of God. Get to know the heart of God. And as you spend time in the Word of God, then the Spirit of God comes and teaches and directs us. So Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. I'm only going to read the uh, first few verses here. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a wayfaring lodging place, that I might leave my people and go from them, for all of them are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like their bows, lies, and not truth prevail in the land, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor. Do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily. Every neighbor goes about as a slander. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to lie, uh, to speak lies, they weary themselves committing iniquity. Father, I thank you for your holy word. Holy Spirit, come and open our hearts to receive what you would have us understand. Speak by your spirit, Lord. Lodge the truth in our hearts that we walk in holiness and righteousness. Help us, Lord, to be holy people of God. Help us to radiate that character of holiness even as you, Jesus, when you walked on the earth, you were the holy man of God. Help us, Lord, to be that kind of person, to be like you. And Jesus, as we look at this passage with the strong message, bring a spirit of repentance in anyone in the house who has sin in their lives. Come, Holy Spirit, and put your finger on that spot where saints should not be where sin should not be. Father, I pray that you'd bring conviction where conviction is needed and that you'd bring encouragement where encouragement is needed. <clears throat> Come, Holy Spirit, and do your work. <clears throat> In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in this book, 
we see that faithless people of God receive the punishment of God. You do not want to be a faithless believer. God has called you to walk in holiness. God has called every one of us to walk holy before the Lord. I pray that we all are walking holy before God. He sees every one of us. He sees what you're thinking about. And as we think or have evil thoughts come into our mind, we need to let God take control of that. We need to surrender thoughts to the Lord. Because God sees those. God knows them. The more you dwell on evil, the more you go down that path. So in this uh, passage of scripture, we see char uh, characteristics, three main characteristics of uh, faithless people of God. These characteristics should not be in your life. They shouldn't be in the life of the believer. And the first one is that the faithless people of God are guilty of adultery. Two kinds of adultery, physical uh, adultery and spiritual adultery. And we see that this is an ongoing lifestyle with no regard for the Lord or his commandments. People who commit adultery really are slapping God in the face. You're pleasing your selfish lusts to slap God in the face. Beware. You're on dangerous ground if you're doing that. The people of God are being affected by sexual immorality that is prevalent in the land. Instead of the other way around, sexual affairs between married couples were flourishing in the land back in Jeremiah's day. You know, that even happens in this day. Sexual immorality that is prevalent and sometimes, brothers and sisters, it happens in the house of God where the people of God who are holy or supposed to be holy are committing these kinds of sins. That should never be in the house of God. And I pray the Holy Spirit would get a hold of people's hearts and convict them of that kind of wickedness. It's not what we should be about. And you know what? There's even been sexual immorality in the lives of some pastors. I know pastors who have forsaken God and taken other men's wives. How could that be? Should never be. But it happens. And they need to repent because we have a God whose arms are open for you to come and repent of sin. Come and get right with God. We're living in the last days, and many backslide from the truth and God's commandment. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 8 to 11 state, Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery? and swear falsely and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk after other gods that you have not known. Then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered that you may do all these abominations. Has the house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. God sees everything. You can't hide anything from God. You know the guy who's into pornography and at nighttime when everybody's sleeping, he gets on his computer and he says to himself, nobody sees what I'm doing, but God sees. God knows what's in your heart. God knows what you're doing. And if you're doing evil, beware. Beware. Jeremiah's day. This was the lifestyle of the Ju Judeans, along with spiritual adultery. 
In their wickedness and disobedience, the people followed after pagan gods, Baal, Chemosh, Milcom, and Molech. And the Bible says in Jeremiah th- uh, chapter 7, verse 31, they have built the high places of Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. People worshiping these false gods and sacrificing their kids, burning their children in the fires to show their devotion to these pagan gods. You wonder how the people of God could backslide to such a degrading level. But it happens. I remember talking to uh, Brian Rutten. He's my son's father-in-law. And we were out for a meal, and he and I were talking about, uh, about the whole concept of being sold out to God. And he was telling me, Over in Africa, there's a tribe, and it's their tradition in this tribe, before they get married, the man would have sex with the the wife-to-be and to see if she would have a baby. If she had a baby, they would kill that baby, and then they would get married. And I was shocked at that whole concept. And he said, You have the same problem in Canada. So many parents are sacrificing their kids in abortion. Those are living babies, and they get sacrificed at the altar of convenience, at the altar of, I want my way. We're living in the last days, and sin abounds. Sin abounds outside there, but sin also abounds in the house of God. There are many in the house of God that we're not aware of. They have a nice smile, nice clothes, look good. They come to the house of God, but evil and wickedness is inside. God sees. We can't see, but God sees. Beware of backsliding and repent. If you don't, the faithless people of God Receive the fearsome punishment of God. Faithless people are guilty of adultery. But secondly, faithless people are are guilty of deceit. And you read about that in uh, verse 3 of chapter 9. They bend their tongues and uh, they bend their tongues like their bows. Lies and not truth prevail in the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, declares the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor, and do not trust any brother, because every brother deals craftily, and their neighbor, every neighbor, goes about as a slander. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. Your dwelling is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, declares the Lord. The picture here is vivid. Tongue is like a bowl, and the lies are the arrows. You have power in your tongue. You can kill someone with your tongue. The power to destroy is there between your teeth. That member called the tongue. Remember James, how he is speaking about the tongue and the evil of the tongue. Well, uh, Old Testament has a lot of New Testament truth. And David in in Psalm 64, 3 to 7, he says, Who have sharpened their tongues like a sword, they aimed bitter speech as their arrows to show to to shoot from uh, concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who can see them? They devise injustices, saying, we are ready with a well-conceived plot. For the inward thought 
and the heart of man are deep. But God will shoot at them with an arrow, and suddenly they will be wounded. God is on the throne. And if your heart is right with God, that's comforting. But if your heart is not right with God, beware. Beware. Because you fit in the camp of the enemy of God if your heart's not right with God. Unweary, unwearied, the people went from one sin to another. They were valiant, but not for truth. They used their power and influence, not for helping their countrymen, but for oppressing the poor and the needy. They had completely abandoned moral and social standards. If you are not a man or woman of your word, you're fitting into this category. You as a Christian should be known for your word being your bond. Being a man or woman of God, when you say something to me, I can depend on that. I should be able to depend on what you say. As a Christian, your word should be your bond. But there's many Christians who say something and forget about it. And so their word, their promise is nothing. God sees and hears that. God knows that. Shouldn't be in your life, brothers and sisters. If you say something, if you promise something, go through with what you say. You need to be a person, a man or a woman of your word. Your word should be your bond. There is a character flaw when you say things and you never follow through. Definitely a character flaw. Members who sign membership application forms and say you will tithe, which is 10% of your salary, and then you don't, that's deception. And God sees that. I know I'm getting a little nitpicky here, but I, I remember one brother, he came for membership and he signed he was going to tithe, and then he came and he said, Pastor, Spirit of God is convicting me. I'm not tithing like I should be. So he turned his membership in. That was a man of honor because he listened to the Spirit of God. When you sign your name saying you're going to do something, you better do it. People of God who live in that kind of deceit will face the hand of God's judgment. You know, Malachi, you hear about Malachi all the time when they're preaching on tithing. Malachi uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. It's terrible to have people of God that you can't trust. This is what Jeremiah faced in his day. People who claimed to be people of God, but they didn't live it. Jeremiah chapter 7 verses 8 to 11 state, Behold, you are trusting in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely and offer sacrifices to Baal and walk after other gods that you have not known? Then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered, that you may do all these abominations. As this house, which is called by my name, Become a den of robbers in your sight. Behold, I, even I, have seen it, declares the Lord. God keeps records, and he sees the heart of man and woman. God knows what you're like. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what's in our heart. And if you're thinking right, and if you're doing right, that's comforting. 
But if you're not, that should be convicting. Faithless people of God are guilty of adultery. Faithless people of God are guilty of deceit. And thirdly, faithless people of God are guilty of pride. And you see that towards the end of chapter 9, verse, uh, I'm going to read verse uh, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Hallelujah. Jeremiah speaks of three things in which men of the world trust. Wisdom, strength, and riches. But these cannot ward off disaster and the Lord's displeasure. Men's wisdom is not like God's wisdom. People who have degrees and intellectual scholarship are warned by God not to be proud and arrogant because they have such education and also not to trust in their education but to trust in the Lord. It's not wrong to get education and degrees but it is wrong to be proud and arrogant about them. 1972, I graduated with my uh, Bachelor of Arts. 1977, I got my Master of Divinity. 1993, I got my Doctor of Ministries degrees. These degrees do not make me any better than any of the people of God. But I felt God led me to pursue education that I'd understand the Bible better. I know Pastor Jonathan has the same concept. He's got his bachelor's, his master's, and his doctorate. Jeremy got his bachelor's, his master's, master's degree, and his doctorate, now he's pursuing another degree, master of business administration or something. Uh, those are not wrong, but it is wrong to get arrogant and to get proud and say, I got all these degrees behind me, you need to listen to me. You don't need to listen to me because of those degrees. You need to listen to me because God speaks from his holy word. That's what we need. God's word. Put your faith and trust in the word of the living God. He's the one who's going to lead and guide and direct you. He's the one who will show you what to do. Apostle Paul was probably one of the most educated men in his time. But we don't see his pride. in. Uh, in you don't see pride in the life of the Apostle Paul. James Chapter 3, verse 13 says, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy, uh, without hypocrisy. Where did that scripture go? Without hypocrisy. And uh, the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And then Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Amazing how God is the one who will lead and guide and direct us. He's the one who teaches us. 
He's the master teacher. He's the one, as you read the Word of God, and we should be reading the Word of God every day. Make it a habit. Read the Scripture every day. You know, if you can't read the Bible, then don't eat. Make that a, a law in your life. If you can't read the Bible today, then you can't eat. I think that'll help us read the Bible every day. <laughs> if we live that way, because food is so important in the Pentecostal churches, eh? It, you know, up there we saw all the food that we're having and everything. Read the word. This is our spiritual food. This is what makes us grow into men and women of God who love the Lord, who walk in holiness, who walk in righteousness, who please the Lord. God loves his saints that are in his word. God loves us when we walk according to the holy word of God. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. That was a pretty weak amen. <laughs> right on. It's amazing how awesome it is to be in the Word of God. You know, these proud people that uh, Jeremiah is talking about, they boasted in their might. Their might is not the moral strength of righteousness. Their wealth is not the spiritual riches immune uh, to theft or corrosion. Then as now, the scholar, the athlete, the warrior, the financier were highly esteemed. Such persons are prone to trusting in their own resources. Wisdom, strength, or riches cannot help the worldly. If these fall short in the time of need, what will avail? Our highest good is to know. The highest good, the highest aspiration that you should have is to get to know God and walk in the fullness of the Spirit of God. There's no greater ambition than knowing the Lord and walking with Him every day. As we walk with God, how awesome life will be. Not just intellectually or philosophically, but in spirit and in his true character. This is the true and lasting wisdom. The source of our highest blessing is the knowledge of God. As John chapter 17, verse 3, the Bible says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The path of God's approval is clear. You can live under a cloud of God's glory. You can live in joy and contentment and peace when you walk according to the word of God. You can know the blessing of God. But if you're dabbling on the other side, if you're looking at pornography at night and everybody's sleeping, God sees that. If you're taking another lady out when you're married, God sees that. Watch out how you live. We need to live holy lives, lives that are committed to the principles of God's word. And you're never going to know the principles of God's word if you're never reading it. You need to be in the word of God. The path of God's approval is clear. Observe the ethical qualities in verse 24. Follow a true knowledge of God. God manifests loving kindness. That's the kind of God we serve. You can spit in his face. You can deny him. You can do all kinds of evil. And then you come to him and you wrap his arms around you if you repent. You need to know the power. Of God's loving kindness. Come to him while there's yet time. If there's sin in your life, come to Jesus and feel his arms of comfort and love wrap around you because his grace will forgive you for those sins. But if you don't come to him, there is no forgiveness. You're going to face his judgment and his wrath. 
God manifests his loving kindness. He manifests his justice, a proper evaluation of the rights of men. And righteousness, the absolute essential of all faith and worship. So know the Lord and the activities that please him. Holiness is a big part of the life of the believer. Know what is right and what is wrong. Know what God loves and what God detests. And you should have a hatred for sin like God has a hatred for sin. God hates sin because it defiles his creation. But when you come to him and love him and surrender and cry out to him, he'll forgive you. And then you experience the love of God. People who are faithless are guilty of adultery. They're guilty of deceit. And they're guilty of pride. And I have the solution for you. If you're in that camp, when you come to know Jesus as Savior, he forgives you for all that filth. He forgives you for all that sin. That's the kind of God we serve. Repentance is the solution to these sins. And when you call on Jesus, he will set you free and help you. However, you must be willing to obey him and walk in his path. Holiness is essential. Now, I don't know if there's any in here that do not know Jesus. I don't know. But God knows. God knows where you're at. So at this time, I want you to... Uh, all stand, and if there's anyone here that has sin in your heart, you don't know Jesus, maybe you walked in and you've never been in a church and you don't know Jesus, I want you to know that our altar here is open for you to come and pray and ask God to forgive you for your sins. If you're in that state, if there's anyone here, come to the altar at this time. Come. And meet Jesus. Come and confess your sins. Come and be right with God. You might have been a Christian for years, but you've been hiding your sin. Nobody's going to condemn you here. We want you to come to the altar and meet Jesus. Have your life clean. Nobody needs to know what that sin is, but God knows. So the altar's open for any who desire to come and be right with God. Holy Spirit, move on our hearts. Lord, you're the one who knows the hearts of man and woman. You're the one who knows where each one of us is at. Father, I pray by your Spirit you would deal with each one of us. Father, may we be holy people, people who love you and walk after you with all our heart. And it's so easy if we are sinners to come and know you as Savior. If there's sin in the life of any believer here, I know you can cleanse us and make us pure and holy. Lord, we commit our lives into your hands. And I know as the saints of God are praying, I know if there's anyone here that has sin in their hearts. Father, that you will bring them to the right place where they would confess their sins and make it right with you. We love you, Jesus. We love you with all our hearts. Guide and direct each one that's here. Father, we commit our lives into your hands now and ask that you would uh, have your will and your way. In Jesus' name we pray. called to be holy because we serve the one who is holy and uh, he enables us to live and walk in holiness we're going to close our service with this song holy forever let's just uh, focus on our hearts that our hearts would be holy a thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the
are called to live a life of holiness as well. To close our service, I'm going to call our superintendent from the District of Alberta is here this morning, Gary Tatinger. I'm going to ask if he would come and close our service with a word of prayer. It's a privilege to have him and his beautiful wife, Carrie, with us this morning. And let's just welcome them here this morning. Thank you. We've heard from the Word of God. Uh, what could be more important in the world today, with all the confusion that exists around the globe, than to hear a clear, authentic challenge from the Word of God? That's, that's what will untangle our minds, <laughs> won't it? And we've heard that. Thank you, Brother Fellow. And thank you, uh, Naomi and Jonathan leadership in this church. We partner with uh, 125 other churches from the Arctic Ocean down to the U.S. border and to Alberta. And uh, it's a delight to be able to just pray blessing upon you as you go your way to serve God this day. Let's mm -hmm. bow our hearts together. Our Father, we thank you that uh, we are not without remedy. With all of the uh, crushing thoughts of what will happen culturally, socially, economically, globally. Uh, you are the hope of the world. You are the creator who made us. And you are not silent. You have spoken to us. You've revealed yourself to us through the creation, through the scriptures, and through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have an anchor in all of this tempest of life. We, we have a hope and a future as we put our trust in you. And we've been reminded of that today. I pray that as we go our way, you would strengthen us in our confidence that you can cause whatever we are facing this week, whatever is going on in our lives, as the pastor challenged us at the outset of this service, whatever load we may have walked into this service with, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us mm -hmm. and even the confusing circumstances we might face in this world. We know that if we love God and are the called according to his purpose, that you will cause even those things to work out for our deliverance, mm -hmm. to help us implement our salvation, mm -hmm. and even cause them to work out in your master plan for our good. And so we put our trust in you today as we go into our field of service to our families. We pray your hedge of protection around this entire congregation, its leadership, and everyone that's here. In the name and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great week. <laughs>